Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Okay, hello and welcome automotive world. This is the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Tipping. I will be your host today. Thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Today, I have a parasitic draw case study for you, and we haven't really talked a whole lot about parasitic draws on this show, besides the fact that they can be challenging, and uh, this one definitely did challenge me. I kind of got my butt kicked on it, in all honesty, but that's okay. We can still learn quite a bit from it. I know that I did. Um, Parasitic draws have been around as long as batteries have been around, and while it used to be a little simpler to find where something was staying on and draining the battery after the key, after the ignition had been shut off, used to be a little bit easier. Uh, I remember when I was first shown how to find a parasitic draw, what's pulling the battery down after the key's off, you connect a test light in series between the negative battery post and the negative cable, and if that test light lights, well, you have a draw and you pull fuses until that test light goes out. Well, of course, you know, on, a, on an older vehicle, it worked, it was efficient, and it was easy enough to figure out what was drawing. Um, as vehicles progressed, that did not continue to be a reliable method to find a draw. You'd hook up that test light in series and you'd actually have a blinking test light. And I remember the first time I saw that and I was like, well, what, what's that mean? <laughs> and uh, I switched to using an ammeter in series instead of a test light and you could measure all the way down to milliamps of draw, which is where we need to see, you know. Typically, you know, 50 milliamps is the most draw we want to see on a battery once everything has gone to sleep. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about with modern vehicles is we need to make sure that the vehicle, all the modules are actually asleep, which is in the power down state, not drawing a significant amount off that battery. Again, under 50 milliamps is what we want to see on a power down vehicle coming out of the battery. Of course, there are other ways that we can measure the parasitic draw off the battery. Uh, We can use inductive clamps, whether that be a sole inductive clamp that has a readout on the body. Um, I've I've got a $40 one that works fantastically for this to check uh, larger draws like the one I had in this case. And we can also use scope leads, uh, which are amp clamps, and they'll show us a waveform. And we can look at those to see, you know, what is the draw all the way down to milliamps. Uh, We can also measure the voltage drop across fuses, and you can use a regular voltmeter for this. They also have a tool called an amp hound. Um, I have one of these, and uh, it works fairly well, Um, but if you use the power probe chart, um, they have it out there in the internet, Um, you can just use a voltmeter, put it across the two terminals for a given fuse, and it's if there's current flowing, there'll be a very small amount of voltage drop across that fuse. You correlate that to the size and the rating of the fuse, and it will give you an amount of amperage that's flowing through that circuit. And it's fairly accurate. Um, it's a it's a good way to tell without pulling fuses because again on modern vehicles we can't just yank fuses out of the fuse box and look for that draw to go away because. We can wake up other modules by pulling fuses, and it's going to disrupt the whole process. So on a modern vehicle, parasitic draws have become much more challenging, where we have to wait for the vehicle to go to sleep, and that we have so many different modules that need to be asleep. And this gives us a lot of possibilities for things to be awake, too, that we can't necessarily see or hear. A lot of the time on older vehicles, again, you're looking for like a light bulb that's staying on or something like that. But a lot of the times you don't necessarily have a visual cue if a module is staying awake. Uh, One other method that I haven't been extremely successful with, but I've seen people out there be successful with it, is to use a thermal imager and let the vehicle sit 
to get cold essentially and then you use your thermal imager and that's going to show you a relay a module a component that's actually staying warm because of the current flowing through it maybe it's a radio or an instrument cluster or a relay something like that it's going to be hotter than the components around it if it has current flowing through it and that would be you know one way you could get a visual cue again depends on where that draw is and how much the draw is too. Uh, if we have a very small draw, it might not show up. Uh, the ambient temperature plays a role there too. If it's re really hot out, that's going to be challenging to see. If it's cold out, it might be easier. But let's get into the case study, and I should give everybody a disclaimer before we jump into this. I mentioned that I got my butt kicked on this. Uh, this is a 2006 BMW 325i. And here, here's the deal. I am not extremely well versed in European vehicles. That's that's the first thing uh, that I should mention is I just don't see enough of them. Um, obviously, I need to go <laughs> to more training, but it's one of those things where if you don't do it on a regular basis, uh, it's not going to be your, your strong point. You have to do something repetitively over and over again to get really good and efficient at uh, you know, working or diagnosing these vehicles. And where I'm at, I'm kind of in the sticks, I only get maybe a couple calls a month on European stuff. I mean, I see more Volkswagen and Audi than anything, but for BMW and Mercedes, um, it's just every once in a while. So uh, often when I'm working on these vehicles, I'm trying to learn the system as I go, kind of on the fly, or at least doing a little bit of prep work ahead of time, but you don't always know what you're going to be getting into. Um, and, and that's not efficient for diagnostics, especially when you're trying to do mobile stuff and you're trying to do it fast. Um, learning it on the fly is is not the best way to go. So I, I struggle with these. Uh, that's just uh, that's how it is. And I aim to get better. And this one hopefully will help me along that way. Uh, the other thing I mentioned is, hey, those parasitic draws on modern vehicles are not necessarily easy things. And I'm not the greatest at those either. It's one of those things where I still struggle a little bit and I'm still learning as I go. So what I'm trying to get at here, there is probably, I, I would say there is definitely a more efficient way to get through the problem than what I did. And I'm willing to accept that right now. And somebody out there listening probably is like, wow, why didn't you just do this? I'm totally fine with that. Heck, I want to hear what you have to say. But uh, this was the route that I took. And I think that, uh, number one, I learned some things by doing this. And I think hopefully someone out there can do the same. They can get, gain some information out of what I went through on this vehicle to figure out what was causing the parasitic draw. So let's get into the case study. I got called in, obviously, for this 2006 BMW 325i, had a parasitic draw. Uh, the shop told me they had replaced the battery. I asked them if they registered it in the with the scan tool. They said no. So that was actually one of the first things that I wanted to do. Um, because after you replace a battery on one of these, you need to register it uh, within using the scan tool function. Um, so I went in and I, I did that and it didn't necessarily change anything um, as far as the draw went. And then they said this thing would go dead overnight. So first thing, um, since I already had my scan tool hooked up for the battery registration, I do an all system scan just to see what's in there. And I know the battery was dead, but um, I want to see, is there anything, you know, real obvious that points to an issue? And it's a German vehicle, so it had a ton of fault codes in it throughout the vehicle. Um, but just doing a quick uh, scan through the codes on the report fault. I didn't see anything that really stood out as that's a parasitic draw problem. So I moved on from there. So my next step is I want to find out how much current is being drawn. Um, I want to get an idea. You know, is this half an amp? Is it an amp? Is it two amps? And that doesn't necessarily give me the answer, but number one, I need to know you know, what amount of current draw am I looking to drop? You know, how far has it got to go down to get within that normal range of 50 milliamps? And it could give me an idea of what component is staying awake too. Again, not an exact answer, but let, let me give you an example. If it's drawing half an amp, which would be 500 milliamps, that's too much. That'll drain the battery, but that's not a blower motor staying on or that's... Um, 
I guess, I guess there, there's a lot of variables there, but still, I want to know the amount of current that's being drawn from this battery. But in order to do that, like I mentioned before, we've got to wait for the system, the vehicle to power down, to go to sleep. All the modules need to shut off, stop talking and stop drawing, you know, a large amount of current. They'll draw some, they'll draw a little amount to keep the memory functions alive. But again, that total draw off the battery once everything's asleep should be under 50 milliamps. Now, here's where this can be challenging on vehicles, especially modern vehicles, is the wait time for a vehicle to go to sleep. And I remember the first time I ran into this long, long time ago on a Ford Windstar, and it took 40 minutes for the vehicle to actually go to sleep and all the modules to shut down. And that was after you shut the key off, you have to wait those 40 minutes for everything to turn off. And I, the, I remember the first time I did it, I had no idea and I was chasing things that I shouldn't have been chasing. So we need to be aware of this wait time. Now, sometimes you can find this in service information or things like Identifix or some, th something like that. But a lot of times you're just kind of in the dark as far as how long it's going to take. Um, I did find, just for reference on this BMW, it's about 15 minutes for everything to completely go to sleep. Um, and that's that's the time that you would normally have to wait. Uh, one thing I do want to point out here is if you're sitting in the vehicle and you're looking down at the center console, your shifter is right there for the transmission and you have your uh, Prindle switch, which is park, reverse, neutral, drive low. The little orange light will stay illuminated by the park symbol because the vehicle is in park until it goes to sleep. Once it actually powers down and goes to sleep, that light will turn off. And so that's an indication that everything is powered down. So you can wait that 15 minutes or you can actually do something else on these vehicles. Now, I don't know which BMWs have this and which ones don't because, again, I'm not an expert BMW technician, but I went through my scan tool functions. I actually did find this. Uh, I was using the Launch Diagon 4, um, so I'm sure there are other scan tools that can do this, but I know the Launch can because I did it. I went into the CAS module, uh, which is car access system, I believe. And there's a special function within that module to power down the vehicle. So you go in, you say, you hit the power down command, and then it turn, tells you to turn off the key, disconnect your scan tool, and then it powers down the system. It puts it to sleep, if you will, so you don't have to wait that 15 minutes. I wish every vehicle had that feature because that is really, really handy to actually force it to that point rather than sitting there for 15 or 40 or however long it is on any particular vehicle you're forcing this thing to actually go into a power down state so actually really helpful and i got to give it to bmw here that's a super <laughs> cool feature to have so uh, once i found that i did that and I put it into the sleep mode and now I can, you know, officially measure what is my draw that is happening after this thing is powered down um, because you can get erroneous results if there's modules still awake because they haven't powered down yet. Um, so I go to the battery in the trunk and I should mention I opened the hood, I opened all doors, I opened the trunk and then I closed the latches for all of those components. So the switch to tell the car that the door, the trunk or the hood is open is within these switches. So if we close those switches with the door open, you reach in with a screwdriver and you just close that latch, you're essentially closing the switch and you're telling the vehicle that the door or the trunk is closed even though it's open because I know that I'm going to need to access components within the vehicle and within the trunk where the battery is or under the hood without opening a door or a trunk. Because if I do that, I'm going to wake everything back up, which I want to avoid. So uh, prior to doing all this, I opened all the doors, opened the trunk, opened the hood, closed the latches and put it into that power down mode. And now once it's in that state, I go to the battery in the trunk and I want to see what is the current draw. And again, what I'm using here is just a quick check. Um, I'm not actually disconnecting the battery in this case. I'm leaving it connected and I'm going to use an inductive clamp. And I'll put a link to this inductive clamp. It was like 40 or 50 bucks off Amazon and it has a little readout on the front of it and you can do up to 100 amps, has a draw size that'll go around pretty much any battery cable. And it actually has little leads and you can use it as a 
voltmeter too, but um, I use this thing all the time for quick checks. It's not extremely accurate, but it'll get you in the ballpark. And in this case, it was all I needed because as soon as I put that around the negative battery cable coming out off of the battery, I have two amps, uh, roughly two amps. There's a little bit more than that, but we'll call it two amps um, coming out of that battery. Once this thing's in its powered down sleep mode. So that's a pretty large draw. Uh, again, we want to see 50 milliamps. Okay. Uh, this is way more than that. Uh, this would be uh, let's 2000 milliamps. So we're way above where we'd want to be. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, well, I should be able to find this pretty easy. Whatever is awake is pulling some serious current. So I want to try to get an idea where is this going and off of the positive side of the battery uh, there's some fuses on top of the battery um, but there are two big red cables that go off into different directions off of that battery and I put the clamp around both of them and what I end up finding is that the two amp draw is going towards the front of the vehicle um, behind the glove box, there is a junction box. It's like a fuse relay box that feeds, pretty much powers up most of the components in the vehicle. Not everything, but a lot of them. And the two amp draw is coming f from, or uh, should I say going to or coming from, I guess it's coming from that junction box, that fuse relay panel behind the glove box. All right, so now I have a direction to go. I can start checking some stuff. So this is where um, some people might pull some fuses and see if that two amp draw goes away. I want to avoid doing that again because you start pulling fuses and you can wake up other things. Um, we want to try to get an idea of where that current flow is going. But not to say we can't pull a fuse if I want to try that, but... I want to be sure of where that current flow or where that current draw is coming from before I pull anything. So in this case, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use that amp hound that I was talking about. Again, you can use a regular voltmeter for this. And I want to measure the voltage drop across the fuses in this fuse panel. And again, if there's current flowing through these circuits, through the fuses, there's not a lot of voltage drop across these fuses, but it is just enough to register a measure. A measurement you know a measurable amount of voltage drop and depending on the size and the rating of the fuse we can convert that into the, roughly the amount of current that's flowing and really in this case we're just looking for a significant amount of current you know I'm looking for two amps this should be easy to find right well I go through all the fuses which wasn't the easiest task because it's tough to get your uh, meter leads in there but I go through all the fuses in the fuse box and what I end up finding is there was probably five or six different fuses in there that had current draw none of them equal two amps but I would say roughly and this isn't perfect but roughly it all added up to two amps but it was between five or six different fuses you know one one would have half an amp another one would have a quarter of an amp another one would have three tenths and so I'm like okay well what's what's happening here how come I have multiple fuses that are drawing current one thing that we want to consider on a modern vehicle, um, and it took me a little bit of thinking to get to this point. I'm trying to think, well, what's what's happening here? What's staying awake? What's causing all of these circuits to be active? Uh, on a modern vehicle, we have a lot of different control modules, especially on a European vehicle, on a BMW. We've got a ton of different control modules throughout the vehicle. And again, they're supposed to go to sleep, especially once that power down command has been issued or the 15 minutes have passed. We expect all those modules to go into a sleep mode where they're not drawing current. One thing that is going to keep modules awake on a vehicle, and this isn't just BMW, uh, we see this in domestic vehicles as well, is if the CAN bus network or the communications network for the vehicle is act still active. There is a module it's usually one specific module that is still talking on the network, is still saying stuff, and it's causing all the other modules to stay awake. And so in this case, you know, you would have multiple draws. You'd have multiple modules drawing current when they're not supposed to. So uh, what I want to do here, though, is see, do I have activity on my CAN bus? It's just a ch quick check that I want to make. Um, it's not going to tell me everything I need to know, but at least... 
uh, you know, should I still keep going after these fuses and see what they're powering up? And I did look at the uh, the diagram, and a few of them were for the footwell module, and there were a couple other circuits that you know, I didn't quite make sense. But anyways, I want to check this CAN bus. So I pull out my U-scope, which again is a really, really handy tool, and I find the nearest module that I can actually tie into the CAN bus on. And that just happened to be the driver's seat module. It's right underneath the seat, pretty easy to access, and I can tie into the CAN bus. And what I see on there is there is activity. Again, once this vehicle is in its power down state, there is constant CAN bus activity. Something is talking on that network, and it might be multiple modules, but there's activity. And our CAN bus is, um, you know, a pulsed square wave on a high and a low circuit, and both of them had activity. So that's really where my draw is coming from, is multiple modules staying awake. So um, now I'm not really sure where to go at this point. I've got to try to figure out who's talking. That's really the goal is who is staying awake, who is keeping all these other modules awake, who's you know saying something on that CAN bus. That's what I've got to find out. And it's, it's not always an easy task. Um, what I decided to do here, and again, this may not have been the right path because I was actually kind of considering this could wake everything back up, but I connected my scan tool with key off or the key out, I guess you should say on this one, but the, the vehicle's still in its power down state and I have not turned the key on. I plug my scan tool in and I do an all system scan to this. And what I want to see is what modules actually respond in this powered down state. And not all of them do. There are certain modules that I was able to talk to on my first scan that don't respond here, but there are some that do. And so now I'm thinking this test is actually going to help me because this is going to tell me what modules are awake right now. I can make a list, I can disconnect them one at a time, and I can see when the vehicle goes to sleep. That's my plan here. So here's the modules that actually showed up when I scanned the vehicle with it powered down um, and the key off. These actually were on and talking and they talked to my scan tool. And it was the CAS module, the DME, which is BMW's um, engine control module, the SGM, uh, the center roof function module, uh, the instrument cluster, uh, the driver's seat module, which I was, you know, scoped the CAM bus from, and the footwell module. And I think that was everything on there. Those are all on the, the high-speed CAN bus network on this vehicle, and they're all active and talking. So, my module that's keeping stuff awake has got to be one of those modules on the list. Now, they're all on. They're all drawing current. This is where this two-amp draw is coming from. But uh, most likely, there is one specific module that keeps talking, that keeps saying stuff out onto this CAN bus, keeping everything else awake. So I have to figure out which one that is. And I decided at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect these modules one at a time and just unplug them from the, you know, from the, their main connectors, basically um, taking them off of the network and waiting to see if the network goes to sleep. And so I get to my modules that are easy to access. First one was that driver's seat module. It's just one plug under the seat. I disconnected. That didn't work. You know, I wait a couple minutes. The CAN bus is still active. You should see this thing go to sleep pretty quickly um, at this point in a power down state. Give it 30 seconds and this thing should go to no talking, no messages on the CAN bus. Uh, driver's seat module did not do that. So next thing I went to uh, that I was thought would be fairly easy to access was my DME, my engine control module under the hood. I disconnect that. Same thing. We still have activity on the CAN bus and still have the two amp draw as well. I'm monitoring that. But really what I'm putting my eyes on is that CAN bus activity. When does that stop talking? So there weren't any other modules that were really easy to access without major disassembly of components, at least that I was aware of. Again, I'm not a BMW tech, so maybe some of these ones were <laughs> really easy to get to. Um, but as far as what I could see, 
there wasn't easy access to anything. So um, this is when I actually did decide to pull some fuses. And again, this may not have been the right way to go uh, because I could have been activating other things, um, but it did happen to work out for me. So what I decided to do was look at the power distribution wiring diagram for some of these control modules, like my footwell control module, my center roof, my instrument cluster, stuff like that. I want to see what fuses actually feed these control modules. And I'm going to pull these fuses to try to power down these modules by removing their power source rather than unplugging them physically. So again, maybe this doesn't work because modules can have multiple power sources too, but um, this was actually successful for me. So I start pulling the fuses and this is behind the glove box. I'm pulling fuses and what I ended up finding was when I pulled multiple fuses because it actually had I think three or four but I pulled all the fuses for the footwell module which is basically the body control module for domestic vehicles I pull all the fuses for the footwell module and my bus actually goes to sleep and what I did is I made sure I plugged everything else back in so my DME my driver's seat module everything else the way it should be and without that footwell module uh, powered up without the fuses, um, the bus went to sleep. And so what I did was I actually turned the vehicle back on. I went back into my CAS module with the scan tool. I commanded the power down function. I left the fuses out for the footwell module, you know, turned everything back off, took the key out and I waited and it was about 30 seconds. The bus went to sleep and my draw is gone. I'm down to like 45 milliamps, which is perfect. Exactly where I want to see. So my footwell module is the one that's staying awake. That is keeping everything alive on that CAM bus. It is saying stuff. It's causing other modules stay awake, draw power, and that's my draw. Okay, but why is the footwell module staying awake? Why is my body control module? This controls stuff uh, like the doors and windows and things like that on the inside of the vehicle. And it is right where they say it is the name, the footwell module. It's the um, driver's side where you would put your foot um, down behind some carpeting and plastic. But here's, this, here's the thing we want to consider. When a module is staying awake, keeping the CAN bus active, it might not be the fault of that module. And I've seen case studies like this before where other actual physical components on the vehicle keep a module awake, which in this case is keeping other modules awake. So what I did was I put all the fuses back in for the footwell module so it can actually turn on. I turn the vehicle on and I go in to the footwell module and I just want to look through all my inputs on this thing. I want to see if there's something that you know doesn't make sense and I check the codes again just in case I overlooked something and none of the codes really pointed to uh, anything. I, but I'm looking at things like door switches and trunk and different inputs to say, is there an input that's causing this thing to stay awake? And all the door switches were good. Uh, you know, they said close because I had the latches shut. Um, I didn't see a whole lot until I got to the windows. Okay. And under the inputs for the windows, it actually shows all the switch positions. So this would be the switch to roll your window up and down with the power window. And for three of the four doors, it said not actuated, which means the switch was not being pressed. But for the right rear, the right rear door, the right rear window, it said closing. Okay. Not closed, but closing. And I thought that was odd. And so I look over and <laughs> this is just, you know, sometimes you find the problem and you're like, yeah, that was awesome. We just did such a sweet job finding that problem is so cool. And then sometimes you're just like, seriously. <laughs> and th that was this moment for me. I'm just kind of like, <sighs> this thing was staring me in the face the whole time, literally staring me in the face the whole time. I had been sitting next to the problem the entire time I was messing around with this vehicle. I got, I got a couple hours into this thing. It really kicked my butt. Um, on, and I'll have a picture in the Facebook group, on the master window switch, so it has all four windows, for the right rear, the window switch was actually being, if you were to pull up on the switch on these, it actually closes the window. 
that switch for the right rear was being forced into that position by a tiny piece of cardboard that had been wedged under the switch at some point or another, probably from the customer driving the vehicle. They had something you know, there, maybe moving the vehicle or something. They activated that switch to close the window. This piece of cardboard got lodged underneath and it kept that switch in that position. Okay. And so it was telling this footwell module that that window is being closed and it never stopped because the switch was forced into that position. Okay. And so the footwell module is going to stay awake, say, Hey guys, you can't go to sleep yet. We're still trying to close this window. (laughs) And so keeping all the other modules awake. So I pull out this tiny piece of cardboard and the, the switch goes back to its normal position. The input on the scan tool says not actuated on the, on the window switch of course, because it's not being forced into that position anymore. And now I shut the vehicle off. I force it in that power down state. Everything goes to sleep pretty much instantaneously within 30 seconds. Um, there's no activity in the CAN bus. There's no excessive draw coming from the battery. Um, that's it. So um, this little tiny piece of cardboard, <laughs> and I showed the I showed the shop owner, and he's he had a good laugh about that too. It's it's crazy how something so small can you know cause a major problem, but also you know. Oh man, just uh, staring me in the face the whole time because I opened that door, you know, if I would have looked down and saw that. I don't know. I don't know if I would have made the connection right away, but um, it would have been something to check at least. But I just, I completely overlooked it. (laughs) And uh, that's just the way it goes sometimes. But that's my case study on this BMW for parasitic draws and some things that we need to consider, some tools that we can use uh, in diagnosing these problems. But hopefully you enjoyed that, learned something from that. Uh, that's all I've got for you today. Uh, but thanks again for tuning in and let's get out there and start fixing the world one car at a time.